Egypt's former vice president says he's having a difficult time renewing his passport. Hamd al Barada is one of many opposition figures facing similar challenges. So have passports become a political tool against the country's opposition? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. There should be no confusion between citizenship rights and state policies. Those are the words of Mohamed al Baradei, Egypt's Nobel Peace Prize laureate, former head of the UN's Atomic Energy Agency. Well, he's accusing the government of delaying issuing his passport for political reasons. And it's not just him. Opposition figures, journalists even say they're unable to renew their passports abroad. The foreign ministry says overseas Egyptians need to return to Cairo for a renewal. Now, opposition figures say that could mean their immediate arrest. Well, al Baradei is one recent and high-profile example. He was Egypt's transitional vice president in July 2013. But a month into the post, he resigned after security forces killed hundreds of protesters in Rabah Square. al Baradei accused authorities of unnecessary violence. And according to the UN Human Rights Chief, the state is continuing to crack down. Zaid Rad al Hussein said on Monday human rights abuses were now fueling radicalization in Egypt. Well, the Egyptian Foreign Ministry has tweeted in response to al Baradei's complaint, saying the passport has indeed been issued in recent days and it's on its way to the Egyptian embassy in Vienna. The crackdown that led al Baradei to resign is still continuing, though, in Egypt, almost four years on. Last year, more than 2,000 people were arrested at protests, many held without trial. More than 400 detainees said police or prison officers mistreated or tortured them. Egyptian security forces are accused of extrajudicially killing between four and ten men in January of this year under the guise of cracking down on ISIL in the Sinai province. And earlier this year, the Egyptian government froze the assets of several NGOs and activists, a decision the EU and the US have both condemned. Let's bring our guests into the show. We have joining us here in Doha, Yahya Ghanim. He's Al Jazeera's Middle East analyst. And we have in London, Saad Jabbar, an international lawyer. And in Woodbridge, Virginia, in the US, Samia Harris, a founding member of Democracy for Egypt. Samia is also a founder of Homeland for All. Welcome to the show, everybody. If I could start uh, with Yahya here in the studio. This issue of, of having problems trying to get your passport renewed. This is not unique to Mr. El Barade, right? How widespread is this? Well, let, let me, when we talk about this issue, we have to differentiate between two terms, uh, the legality and legitimacy. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the legality issues yes. first of all, but if, just to set the discussion up, this is from, from the contacts and research we've done, it doesn't look like this is an exclusively Mohammed Al Barade problem, right? Of course not. So give mean, us an idea about how widespread this is becoming, in, particularly in opposition circles or circles which are for some reason or another viewed as opposition or in the case of journalists perhaps uh, dangerous. As you just stated in your intro, I, uh, th this passport issue has become, has, has turned to be a political tool in the hands of the Egyptian government and uh, they, they, they abuse uh, using this tool against the uh, uh, political uh, opposition. And uh, th that is why I wanted to talk about this uh, differentiate between the legality and legitimacy because it's very important because most of people confuse these two terms because this measure might look as legal uh, from the side of the Egyptian government, but definitely it is illegitimate. And, uh, of course, in the course of right. the program, we will come to define the two terms. All right, we'll come, we'll, we'll come back to Yahya, I promise you, on that one. Sure. But before we do, I want to go to Samia, though, in the U.S. and ask, have you seen evidence, I know your organization conducts research, have you seen evidence to suggest that this passport issue is indeed becoming a political tool, that this is not an administrative process, this is not a simple law and order process? Oh, it's not just the passport. We have to put it in a much larger uh, content. 
uh, the Egyptian government basically is harassing everybody who is an opposition outside of Egypt by making it so difficult for us anytime we need a document uh, either from the embassy or from uh, Egypt. And uh, there are many journalists who are out without their passports, can't get it renewed. There are many politicians and opposition, like Dr. Ayman Noor, for instance, who can't leave Turkey because he doesn't have a passport. And uh, others and the others, they said that they are sending Dr. Parada his passport because he is uh, a prominent person in the international arena. But um, as a matter of fact, the, the Egyptian embassy, I just, uh, I regret to say that I visited it uh, a week ago to get a simple power of attorney, and it turned out to be a nightmare, not a simple issue. Uh, the people were very, very... But, uh, Samia, this is, this is not just a matter of bureaucracy, not a matter of the administrative process? No, it's not a matter, it's a... It's a system that is put to make our life difficult outside Egypt, uh, especially the opposition. Um, it is. Uh, so you're saying you've seen evidence that this applies selectively to opposition people? I do, because there were people in uh, the reception who uh, were not as um, uh, active or not as known as I am in being an activist, and uh, they received a totally different uh, way of, of uh, treatment. I even asked to see the counselor and, uh, you know, to say I have had the same people done uh, three and a half years ago. I sat in Hani's office, the, the counselor at this time, and he right. offered me tea and signed the people. It was no big deal. And uh, this um, uh, first uh, lieutenant or, uh, or helper to the counselor said, well, go find Hani, you know. Uh, this right. is just the way we do it. The perhaps, this a, perhaps this is a good time to point out, in the show, forgive me for interrupting, that we have reached out to the Egyptian Foreign Ministry through all of the contacts uh, which their website lists, and we have not had a response. We would have, of course, loved to have them on this show to hear their side of the story as well. If I could take some of those concerns to Saad, as an international lawyer, where do cases like this sit vis-a-vis -vis international law? Well, the... Um Egyptian regime have breached every rule in the book or they adopted or the, when we talk about the tool or political tool no there is a systematic policy run by the intelligence services and the security services which go ba goes back to the Soviet era uh, the, every regime in Egypt any dictatorial regime in the Arab world they don't only not issue the passport to anyone who is in the opposition, but anyone who doesn't cooperate with the, the, the regime or the security services, I remember very well after the coup d'etat in Algeria, for instance, the Algerian embassy, whenever you apply for a passport, it has to, you, you, are, you are called, if you are a journalist, by the security agent, the, 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 military, the attache, the security or the security service or senior officer, and he will start to question you. And if, well, even when he knew you are not in the opposition, they start to say, why, don't you, why do you allow Mr. X or Y to appear on the channel? How can, we, can you help us to stop it? And sometimes you have to return many times, including also they withhold any document or any service, not only to the opponents who are known opposition members, but those who don't cooperate with the regime. Internationally, this is a breach of the right of the individual to his right of movement and right. the freedom of communication, his right to use the service of the state, including the birth certificate, passport. If you want to register your, um, your the, the birth of your son or you want to have your son or wife's passport to be renewed, even if she was not in the opposition, you cannot get it. Ben Ali of Tunisia used it, Gaddafi used it, Algerians used it and still use it, Iraq used it during Saddam. So this is one of the Okay, uh, since, since we're talking of, sad, let me jump in of any dictatorial regime. Since we're talking about the practical implications of this policy, which, as you pointed out, is uh, unfortunately a widespread uh, tool used by many regimes in the Middle East. Well, if we're talking about the practical implications, why not pause for a second? I think we have someone joining us now who has actually personally gone through this experience. Here he is, Bilal Dardir. He's a photojournalist, covered Egypt between the years of 2012 and 2016. He joins us now 
on Skype from Valencia in Spain. Now, you were covering events in Egypt and then suddenly you have a problem. Tell us a little bit about the beginning of your personal experience. Um, <clears throat> hello, thank you for having me. Um, my story uh, started in July 2016 um, when I received a phone call from a lawyer whom I didn't know who informed me that I was sentenced 15 years in prison uh, due to my work documenting the political turmoil witnessed in the streets of Egypt following the coup of 2013. What, what, what were you sentenced and for? Can we just clarify for the audience the actual sentence against sen you? I was, the accusations were conspiring with foreign media outlets uh, in order to publish rumors about the situation in Egypt which is of course not true because the media outlets that I've dealt with range from the AP, the Xinhua, the Anadolu Agency, which are respected media outlets that uh, obviously will not publish rumors about Egypt. If the situation about in Egypt is bad, it's not the problem of the journalist or the reporter, it's the problem of the people who are responsible for that, which is the government. Right, now I understand that you, you obviously left Egypt, you're in Valencia, yes, I, Spain, it, it, you tried to renew yeah. your passport and you couldn't yeah. while you were overseas. Why? I, uh, I tried to renew my passport in Spain because my passport is about to expire. And once I get my residency in Spain, I try to renew it. But the thing is, uh, in order to renew your passport, you have to have a legal paper, uh, like a legal statement. And in this legal statement, they tell that you are sentenced. And if you are sentenced, they refuse to renew your passport. They say, we're going to issue you a document in order for you to go back to Egypt, which of course I will face immediate arrest. So it doesn't make any sense. So what are the practical implications of that being on your life, Bilal? It means that in six months or less, I will have no passport, which led me to apply for an asylum here in Spain. Because without the passport, I, I, will, I will be like no citizen, basically. So uh, it's, I think it's just a way of crippling the members of the opposition outside Egypt. Okay, uh, try, Ho hold that. To make the life harder. Ho hold that thought for a second. Uh, we may come back to you in a few minutes, uh, if you don't mind hanging on with us, uh, Bilal. But I want to take some of the points which you raised to Saad Jabbar once again, and, and lady and gentlemen here in the studio, bear with me because he mentioned Saad there the issue of a conviction. Now there are many countries which have rules or laws that say if you have a conviction against you, if there's a warrant for your arrest and some countries even if you haven't paid child support there are grounds in which a passport can be denied or, or not issued in the first place what is Egypt doing anything out of order that that other countries wouldn't normally do well they do this outside the law because there is no rule which could justify they are regulations based on the security services of the intelligence services and no passport would be issued without the approval of the officer. The security but, but of I'm the sure, intelligence Sam, the officer... Egyptian authorities would argue like these people have convictions against them, uh, albeit on charges such as yes, conspiring well, no, no. with foreign media or quote-unquote well, being part see. of a soft <laughs> imperialist agenda was another one I came across. Yeah, no, no, this is, this is an old song, it's well known in the dictatorial regimes, you always, you know, spreading, promoting false uh, information. Remember, in Egypt now, there are so many restrictions, including that you should not even mention the number of the people who might have uh, died because of terrorist attacks. So, let me go back to one important issue, which Br is briefly, the regime, please. by not giving, by not granting asylum to, 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 to those who are suspected of not cooperating or being in the opposition, even if they are politically peaceful people, they, they are helping the dissidents to get asylum. I mean, in Spain or in Britain or anywhere else, but rather if we ask for a for a right. passport, for the travel documents where he was, but what it will do, it will harass the people. Okay. They cannot get any travel documents if you are a journalist until you get your uh, documents or approval for your asylum. So they cripple people for okay. two, three, five years. All right, this is so you, they will here pass in your studio. livelihood. You wanted to make a point about what is legitimate, what is legal, and what is not. This is perhaps the good time for you to do that. Go ahead, Yahya. Yeah, I think it's very important to differentiate between the two terms. I mean, uh, uh, the le legality and legitimacy. Uh, the, what, what the Egyptian government uh, is doing might uh, look, judging by the appearances, as legal, but definitely it is not legitimate. Legal is mainly about the law. Legitimate is about the law plus morality, ethics, and fairness. 
when I look upon what the uh, Egyptian government is doing, uh, for me, sometimes in certain cases that I came to know personally, they look, judging by the appearances, as legal. But some other, many other cases, they're neither, neither legal, neither uh, uh, or, uh, uh, nor a uh, uh, legitimate. So it's it's you cannot you cannot justify such behavior uh, based on trumped up cases, uh, politically motivated cases, and that's what we have right. we have been seeing in Egypt for the last four years. You cannot do that. And right. you, you, okay, please go ahead, Samia. Well, I, I think we should really put it in the right frame of uh, work that the Egyptian government is executing at this time. It is to take the birth rights away from its own citizens who were born Egyptian, who have the right by human rights standard to be Egyptian and hold Egyptian passports and ID. And it is giving it to those who al-Sisi and his regime wish uh, to have as Egyptian citizens uh, by selling the citizenship, as we have learned in the past uh, week, selling the citizenship for people not even to pay money, but just to put their money in the Egyptian uh, banks and gain Samia, the citizenship. How, how effective have measures like this been in actually stifling the activities of political opposition abroad? Well, the oppositions are not going to stop. We are not going to stop. We, you know, they can take our passports away, they can take our IDs away, they will never take our soul away. Our soul is the Egyptian soul, that we fight for freedom, we fight for human rights, we fight for bread of, of freedom, the right to, to live uh, as dignified Egyptians. So, so if okay. you believe in the principles of the Egyptian revolution, you are never going to give it up. Okay. Uh, so that, that's something you just can't do. What they are trying to do is harass uh, the activists like myself, like Dr. Bradley, like Dr. Ayman Noor, and uh, the many, many journalists who are outside uh, Egypt. They are not going to succeed. Okay, even on that, on that point, American forgive, regime, me, forgive me for jumping even, in, but it, it may not stop the opposition. I'm wondering, can it stop an individual's life? If we can bring Bilal Derdir back into the discussion again. I mean, once you, you explain that you, you're in a situation where you can't renew your passport, so you had to apply for political asylum. But what does that mean in terms of you continuing to pursue your job, your career? I believe at one point you also were working for the Guardian newspaper of the UK as well as the Associated Press News Agency. Can you continue to do that? Can you, put, can you I don't know, uh, rent a home, put your kids through school, things like that when you, you have no passport? Well, uh, unfortunately, I have had to stop work when, once I escaped Egypt. Uh, so for the past nine months, I haven't written or photographed anything about Egypt. And I, when I came here in Spain and I settled down, I thought about uh, getting back to work in Egypt. But it's very hard because working as a journalist means that I have to be there. I have to talk to sources. I have to do some things myself. So I would say that uh, the government procedure, the government procedure in crippling uh, opposition is, is, is a, a bit effective. And sadly, I have to say that because I know also about other journalists who are in the same situation as mine and who, who are also stopped working due to their current situation. Right. Uh, so I would say that's a bit effective, sadly. What recourse, uh, I'm wondering, let me take this question back to Saad. What recourse does a person have if they believe they've been unfairly denied a, a passport when they're stuck abroad? There is, I'm afraid, no re recourse at all. There is no appeal. There is, this is a Kafka type of list sent by the regime, even sometimes on the base of hearsay. And uh, especially now, we know that the Egyptian judiciary, following the uh, recent act of parliament, they have given the president full power to choose even the heads of the departments in each court of law in Egypt. This is a very new, in addition to the crackdown on independent judges, so the services could obtain any false accusation, and they say because Mr. X is needed by the justice here, therefore we cannot renew his passport. And what the regime does, this is in addition to issuing lists of people they don't like, 
or journalists like what they did Ahmed Mansour and others, who, in order to cripple them from traveling as well, even if they had another passport. In the case of uh, Ahmed Mansour of Jazeera, he had British passport, but he was stopped in Germany at the request of the, um, the Egyptian authorities. For, uh, so even if when you have a foreign passport, the regime now has established various tools, which are, by the way, all tools used by every dictator on earth. What is, what is regrettable is that the Egyptian regime is still, the new regime is, is the old regime. They are right. working with the same tools of dictators of the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Right. And I'm sorry to say, other Arab regimes use the same tools, except Sisi has perfected them because he's, he has no shame to do it. Because it's okay, let, let, let me let me jump in here because you're the onto States, uh, an interesting another. point there. Very little, perhaps, uh, recourse, Yahya. Uh, then, given what Saad is saying about the sort of changes going on in the judiciary in Egypt, the influence of the executive upon the judiciary, looking at some of the charges, frankly, I mean, conspiring with foreign media, um, being part of a soft imperialist agenda, being part of a Zionist scheme to divide Egypt. These are some of the charges which are being brought against journalists for basically what they would say is doing their job. I mean, when you look at things like that, the overall direction that human rights and democracy are taking in Egypt, is there anything that gives you any hope that any of these sorts of grievances can be addressed? Well, under the circumstances, of course, I hate to say that uh, I'm not hopeful. Uh, you see, the, one of the main issues that we suffer in Egypt from is that as, you know, contrary to what it is supposed to be, which is uh, judicializing politics, mm -hmm. uh, the Egyptian regime uh, politicized the judiciary. And this is the main issue here. Uh, it's all politicized. And fortunately and ironically, this has been done when the regime have murdered politics. So it is politicizing judiciary at, at the time when, when, when politics have been murdered. So I, I don't believe under the circumstances that there would be any hope uh, uh, for, uh, you know, to work out uh, okay. these grievances. Uh, but let me, I just want to uh, uh, remind uh, my fellow Egyptians in the uh, Egyptian government and the Egyptian regime of a story that happened back in, in uh, 1906 when, when a group of the occupying force, colonial soldiers, British soldiers, went to the countryside in Egypt for a hunting expedition and mistakenly they killed a villager woman. And because they were afraid of the villagers' revenge, they ran away and one of them died because of a sunstroke, and uh, the uh, uh, the Egyptian government at the time, under the occupying force, they put 93 villagers on trial. Some sentenced for right. life in ten, uh, sentence, and the others were hanged to death. But okay, Mustafa Kamel, the leading and young politician, he raised the world against Egypt, and the Egyptian government ne never even thought right, about revoking got a, got his. A si His 60 passport. seconds left. Let me give it to Samia in 60 seconds, a final thought. Go ahead. Yes, well, uh, the regime as it stands is the enemy of freedom, the enemy of the activists who are calling for a change. But Samia, the, 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 the regime... Egyptian foreign minister says that, that those sorts of accusations are unfair. They're fighting radicalization is what foreign affairs spokesperson uh, Ahmed Abu Zaid says. Sam, I, have, I have dealt with Sam Shokri when he was an ambassador here in uh, the U.S. He gave no time, no respect to Egyptians until the revolutions happened, and he was forced to do it. Uh, for the two years that the revolution was going on, the embassy right. changed. Uh, they were polite, they were courteous, and they were doing what we okay. needed them to do. As soon as uh, this regime uh, with the CC took over, uh, everything went back to rudeness, uh, okay. to lack well, of respect, well, uh, and okay. to we're not serve, to, serve the Egyptian. We're, we're going to have to leave it there, uh, I'm afraid, because we are running obstacle. out of time. Apologies to our guests. I know we can go on with this one, but let's thank our guests, Yahya Ghanim here in the studio, and Saad Jabbar and Samia Harris. And a thank you to our guests who joined us from Valencia, Spain, Mr. Bilal Dardir.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now is goodbye. <laughs>